Jacqueline and I have done research um, on Afghan women. And um, so today we are going to talk a bit about that process, some of the work that has come out of that process, uh, kind of a feminist framework for doing that work, and some of the challenges and some, uh, some um, takeaways from that work. And while we will talk about some theory, we are all, it, it, a lot of it's also kind of feminist methodology. All right, so um, the first project I'm going to talk about is an oral history project called the Red Project. We are um, lucky enough to have uh, Roshan Mashal here, who you're also seeing um, a photo of. Um, and this work, uh, the first project I'm going to talk about, could not have been done without Ma Mashal. And so I want to extend gratitude to Mashal and the support we got through the Texas um, International Education Consortium and the Dean's office, um, Dean Kavanaugh had a vision to bring this person into our college and the work couldn't have happened and I think it's very important work. And then uh, Jacqueline will talk about um, the investigation into the role of collective trauma among Afghan women and her work was done in Ohio mm -hmm. So I think we give you kind of a broad look at um, how, this how this kind of work can be done. Um, first though, I want to say, you know, in, in terms of framing this theoretically, um, coming from a feminist perspective, a feminist viewpoint that um, articulates how women's voices have been left out of a lot of our cultural, political, economic conversations. Um, and oftentimes those conversations and the research done is, has traditionally been through a masculine voice. And so um, feminist theory really wants to open space for women to speak. Um, and there's also a central methodology um, that it's a, uh, the belief that it's essential meaning of women's lives can only be grasped by listening to women themselves. <clears throat> and then, you know, I want to talk about some hurdles to doing this research because there have been many. <laughs> um, starting with a language barrier, right? Which, when you have a language barrier, that also means very costly research because transcribing and transcriptions, um, the, it's already expensive or time consuming to transcribe an interview. But when you also have to translate it and the cost and, and finding, you would not believe how difficult it was to find, to identify people who could actually do this translation. So that alone is very difficult. And can I also make a yes, point Yes, please, that jump in anytime. That Afghanistan as a country, and Michelle, correct me if anything I say about Afghanistan that is incorrect as well, is really only a country because of colonial powers and colonial and Western influence. So it is a multi-ethnic country. There is multiple languages, multiple ethnicities. So I don't know if you guys had more than one language, but for my study, we had three different languages that needed, we needed um, people to collect the data in multiple languages and multiple ethnicities, people to transcribe, people to translate in multiple languages. So in terms of cost of translating the documents, it wasn't just one language. We were doing it in yeah. three. Yeah, exactly. And we did it. At least uh, two is official language in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Dari and Pashto. Mm -hmm. it's, it's on an official. But we have more than 30 languages that people are talking, and uh, uh, it's not easy. So when you talk about that, we could even also talk about who gets left out, yeah. right? Yeah because of these, this issue. So, you know, I can't emphasize enough the barriers that language um, causes in the prevention of doing important research. Um, and in, sorry, I'm sorry. No, please do. And in refugee work, 
with Afghans specifically, most Afghan refugees, before the, the, before the fall of Kabul in 2021, Afghans were not refugees. They were only able to come through a special immigrant visa. And that meant that they had pre someone in the family had previously worked for the United States government. And that most commonly was men working as interpreters for the US government. So in terms of feminist theory, there's also this huge divide in who's getting services and whose voices are being included and left out because within the refugee, the Afghan refugee population, men spoke English more often, do speak English more often. So it's easier to do research with them. It's easier to ask them, what does your community want? And then the voices of women are not included in that because even people who are trying their best to do good work, you, you have to cut corners sometimes. You can't include every voice. And sometimes when it's just easier to talk to men and decide what men want and ask, maybe ask the men, like, what do the women want? but you're not asking the women themselves what they want and they need. Right. And, and my research found that those two things are often vastly different. Right. And going back, to, I'm just going to yeah. go back exactly. to the yeah. only read, way to really grasp it is to listen to women. And then I'm going to jump down to cultural differences, too. And um, uh, the patriarchal structure in Afghanistan mm -hmm. culture also makes it very difficult to talk to women. Yeah. yeah. So, did you want to say anything? No, that's, <laughs> I said that exactly. That's the main challenge for Afghan women. Yeah, because women aren't and unfortunately they brought this patriarchal culture yeah. to the U.S. Yeah. and other mm -hmm. Korean countries. Yeah. And that's so important for us to remember. Just because they're here doesn't mean they've let go of those patriarchal structures that they have lived in, and that the men in their families often, most often, still expect out of them, right? So, um, so these are, and then, and then the, the cost literally as researchers, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a communication researcher, although my, my research is very, or mass comm really, but my research is very much interdisciplinary or cross-discipline, um, but, um, uh, you know, I learned a long time ago when I was trying to get tenure that if I, I come from a journalism background, I prefer to talk to people for my research. That's really the kind of research I like. Um, but I learned very early on that if I did content analysis and, and, and that analyzed me media artifacts, it was cheaper and I could get it done a lot quicker. And when you're on the tenure clock, that all matters, right? So there's reasons we in academia have to take these shortcuts and cut corners. Um, so financial costs, the cost of your time. Mm -hmm. um, and I would even say there's an emotional cost mm -hmm. to this kind of work as well. I'm, there's many times we've shared tears, yeah. Yeah. you know, in this work. Um, and then um, community and individual, individual trust, like, being able to gain trust in that community, being able to gain trust with individuals. And I'm, and again, we could not have done, I, the rug, rug project particularly, I could not have, I, we could not have presented what we did without having someone that was trustworthy to do the work. Yeah. And then a feminist consciousness, literally, wanting to make sure that we are not just taking mm -hmm. from these women, mm -hmm. getting something from them so that we could advance in our work, in our you know, position in the university. To be able to um, feel like, you know, sometimes you feel like you're just taking mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. a subject, when they call the word, you know, a participant, a subject, right? Um, so um, that also is a hurdle that you need to cross and, and come to terms with and make sure you're not using these people for your own personal gain. Can I ask? Yes, please. Yeah, I want to appreciate and thank you. Uh, the UTA, you get the African women, especially to interview a, a lot because you get them that, that you amplify their voices you record the, their histories. So otherwise, it was not possible. That's a big history of Afghan women, how they 
lost everything and how they became a refugee of, and how they are resilient but starting from scratch. They need some support from the community to hear, hear from them and to amplify yeah. their voices. You give, you give we did lot. that. We yeah. did that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for me, it was a lot. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Um, and, and I just have a few quotes up here that I think are important. And, and again, who has been allowed to have a voice? We've talked about men, right? Having more of a voice than women. But also, different women have had more space than other women. So, in, and this is part of, again, is framing um, all of our work with under a feminist lens, right? Making sure that uh, you know, sustained uh, reflection on being a woman, the kind that can actually do theory, that can, you know, conduct this research. Um, we enjoy a certain amount of political, social, economic, and uh, privilege, including skin color, ethnicity, all of these things. And this became more clear it, to me than ever experience in this research. Um, <clears throat> so how do we, academics interested and dependent on producing research, center women's stories, lives, and experiences? And I think that in showing you the RUG project, um, it's an example of how we can do this. So um, the RUG project is an oral history. Oral histories, feminist oral histories center women's voices. They focus on marginalized experiences and perspectives. They bring light to often overlooked contributions, a feminist lens. Um, and then I added digital technologies because they are instrumental and, and an amazing tool for what we can do now for bringing women's voices to light. And I will say that, you know, Afghanistan, so in, it fell to the Taliban in 2021, but was it? 1996. 96. Um, prior to 1996, it was in Taliban rule, mm -hmm. and then there was a 20-year reprieve. And Michelle and I talked a lot about how that history prior to 1996, women's experiences during that are lost. Mm -hmm. There has not been documentation of that. So it was so important for us to be able to say, let's document this now. So it's her, her country's history is not lost. Her sisterhood, sisters are not, histories are not lost. So, so I want to show you the RUG project. And what I'll say is, yes, um, this started as a project with me and colleagues at Michelle, of course, and colleagues in uh, the Department of Communication. And, um, we conducted 18 interviews, video conference, uh, video conferencing interviews. Michelle did the interviews. We all worked to structure the, um, the, the questions. And she completed um, 18 interviews with women in Canada, US, UK, um, United Arab Emirates, and Greece and Palestine. Pakistan. Um, so they were all women who had left um, and we're now refugees, left Afghanistan and we're now refugees. Um, and so let, I want to show you the, the, what came of this project. It, we still don't have all the interviews up because they were incredibly time consuming and it's been, uh, we employed three different, a grad student and two undergrads that worked on it for over a year. Um, it's been a really uh, long project, um, but what you'll see here is the website and the stories. You can start to see some of the stories, and um, I just want to show you how it's laid out. So you, we have the story here, and then the interview is here in English. So the idea is that anyone now could come and use this oral history project to do research or to write policy or to you know for nonprofits to use this and these women's voices um, to um, you know to help Afghan women um, and I'm just gonna just 
give you a small sampling just so you can hear. Oh, wait, you aren't able to hear. Um, let's see if this will work. And if it doesn't, then, oh, okay, no. <laughs> سلام حال دارید امیدوار هستم شما خوب باشین تشکر از که امروز در این مصاحبه امروی ما اشتراک کردیم میخواییم از شما پشنیم که آماده هست از آدرس شبکی زنه افغانستان سر از قانون دوباره کافی و قانون آماده بود که در پارلمان بر تصیب برای یک روز پیش از آمدن طالبان there's 18 or 18 interviews and they're over an hour long each but what i wanted to show you was how we produced them how and this this was again a undergrad spending many many hours to to um to time stamp and to make sure that the english language transcript matches when they're actually speaking whatever words they're speaking on the video um, and also making sure that it's searchable this way as well. Um, and so, so anyway, um, there's some amazing stories on here and I really, really encourage you to spend some time on this site. Um, the full interviews have English captions, as you saw, they're transcribed. There's interview profile um, documents um, little biographies about each that are going up. We have short video clips that we've been pushing out on social media. Um, yeah, so we, it, you know, it, it was a big, big project. Um, and, you know, some of the, they talk about life before leaving. They talk about the, the day and the process of leaving. Um, and they talk about their lives as refugees. And my guess is you won't be able to get through one of the interviews without tearing up at least once. The stories are really hard and we made the decision to keep the entire, we don't edit these. Because again, this is about women's voices, women's stories, and them being able to have a voice. And what, you know, they, they thank Michelle for selecting them to be able to tell their stories right and and I could not have gotten these stories even if I hired someone to to transcribe them and to interpret there's no way I could have gotten these stories because Michelle is a refugee and they they shared that and were able to 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 talk in a way that we never could so most women who participated in the project um, told those in-depth stories. Um, and without the compassion of Michelle, that couldn't have happened. Um, some of the lessons we learned, one of the biggest was just, I mean, the stories themselves. We are all better people for understanding Afghanistan, understanding women's lives in another space besides the one we live in. Um, and, and then, of course, just to not underestimate the time and cost of doing this kind of work. So I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Kirsch. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is a project that I did as part of, it ended up being my dissertation research, but I think the most important aspect of the project is to know that it was community-based research. It was the ideas and the the whole project came to fruition because the Afghan community requested it, because they wanted this information. So some background on me is that I I'm a I was a social worker in practice for over a decade before I got my PhD and worked primarily with refugee populations. So I worked as a case manager, I worked as a therapist, I worked as a program manager, I worked in multiple capacities within refugee resettlement kind of across the spectrum. And there's a relatively large Afghan population in Columbus, Ohio, where I worked and lived. And so I you know, formed these relationships with interpreters, with community leaders while I was in practice that continued. 
um, if you learn anything about working with refugees is they don't stay colleagues, they become friends very quickly. Um, and that was true for me too in Columbus. So when in 2021, if you all remember back to that time of the uncertainty when the United States decided to pull out of Afghanistan, when there was complete chaos, when you saw the pictures of thousands of Afghans trying to get on planes and the horrific images that we were seeing, I had members of the Afghan community coming together and talking in WhatsApp groups and saying, we're gonna get this influx of people and we wanna support them better than we were supported when we came. We didn't get the support we needed because there wasn't a large community at the time and we wanna be those people that we didn't have. And part of what came out of those conversations is a lot of things came out of setting up um, food drives and places where people could buy furniture and maps and WhatsApp groups so they knew where they could buy halal food. Like all of those things came out of it on the ground. But what really, from the research perspective, was also these people saying, we don't know anything about our community. We don't know what the needs are. How can we do research and how can we figure out what those needs are to better serve future groups of both Afghan and other refugee populations that come into Columbus? So this wasn't researchers going into the community and deciding these are the questions to ask. It really was this whole group of people from all different stakeholders, Afghans, caseworkers, researchers, coming together to answer these questions. Um, and there's a woman named Shema Dada who is my mashal in Columbus, who again, this research would never have happened without her. She was the true leader, the pioneer. She collected 99% of these surveys, even though we had six other researchers, or six other um, Afghans helping. Like She was so passionate about that and continues to be passionate about wanting to help her community. So um, we did a mixed method study. We did a community survey with 178 Afghans really across the spectrum, people who had arrived, this, the, uh, the data was collected in 2023. So it was a combination of people who had arrived after 2021 and people who had been here since the Soviet Union invasion of Afghanistan in 1986. 1986? 97. Um, so we did interviews and then we also did focus groups. And this study was a mixed group. It was both men and women. Um, but our focus groups were, ge were gendered. So we had men's focus groups and we had women's focus groups off of the instruction of our leaders for so much of what we talked about of the importance of really highlighting women's voices. So a big question that I was interested in as a research researcher and something I saw when I worked with refugee communities, especially Afghans, is this idea of collective and historical trauma. We often come to refugee context and think of how to treat mental health in a very Western perspective. So really focusing on individual. How do we get more people to go to therapy? How do we get more people to engage in CBT and these really individual cognitive behavioral therapy, sorry, um, not in a room of social workers, um, and a very um, individualized way because that's how we see mental health from a Western perspective, and I have a lot of thoughts on why we shouldn't see it from a Western perspective like that either, but really focusing on this context, most refugee groups, including Afghans, come from these really collective cultures. Community and family take precedent. Those are so much more important than your own individual needs. So we must also look at how do we make people well from that perspective as well. So I used the historical trauma theory to really ground a lot of the study and that's a framework that was developed originally for indigenous populations in North America and discusses and explains the transmission of trauma, how it spans across generations. People have endured collective and prolonged trauma. It's not these individual level, you know, we think of the word trauma in the United States and we often think of one individual event that happens that are horrific and bad and I'm not minimizing those experiences at all, of course. We think of sexual assault, we think of a car accident, we think of the death of someone that we love, we think of that as trauma versus this collective historical perspective of thinking about maybe not like an individual event, but things like colonization, like genocide, war, displacement, these big things that happen that would impact anyone, but especially when you're from a collective culture and those things are so important. 
family, land, uh, culture, language. The loss of those, those is so impactful. And so when we think of the indigenous perspective of where this framework came from, and we think of um, the impacts of colonization on indigenous populations in North America, the displacement, the loss of their land, the loss of their people, boarding school experiences, loss of language, loss of culture, the impacts of alcohol on these communities. We think we can see those big cultural, um, the cultural genocide that happened to these groups of people. And that looks really similar in a lot of refugee communities. Refugees are often refugees because of colonization. What's happening in Afghanistan, what has happened in the last 50 years and what will probably happen in the next 50 years, and why the Taliban is the current ruler in Afghanistan can directly be related to colonization. They have the impacts of those things, of genocide, of colonization, of Western people coming into their spaces and telling them how to do things. Okay? So, Um, so, it really focuses on, focuses on these experiences of loss of language, culture, land, and those having significant impacts on mental health and well-being among these groups. Um, refugees have similar impacts, um, and within my dissertation work, found that the impacts of historical trauma on Afghan mental health are worse for women than they are for men. And I think another important theoretical framework to think about in this context that I didn't, I don't have a slide on, but is thinking about intersectionality and the importance of the intersecting minoritized statuses of Afghan women, both as refugees and immigrants, as Muslim women, being from a minoritized religion and being women all at the same time and the impact of that. Being from a religion where wearing hijab is very normal and that really can put a target on Muslim women back because it, it, it shows their faith very out loud and in person, right? So thinking of those intersectionalities and the impact of that on Afghan women is really important. So I'm just going to focus on some of the qualitative findings that we had, especially in relation to women. So overarchingly, we, taught, we, we found that there are large impacts of collective trauma, specifically on women, cultural loss, separation from family, and fear for the future, especially fear for the future of what um, women were specifically concerned about the future of their children and what their children would experience, how their children would continue the culture or language experiences of being Afghan while also trying to fit into the space of being an American. The impact of post-migration stress that coming to the United States is really, really hard. We are not this land of opportunity with gold paved roads that people describe us as, right? There's not enough support. They don't. There's not enough opportunity to be self-sufficient in terms of jobs, housing, um, school support, etc. Um, and that collective trauma needs collective solutions. The way to heal collective trauma is not to send everyone to individual therapy, but people and especially women talked about creating spaces, creating a community center, creating groups in spaces that were safe for Afghan women to come together and celebrate their culture and talk about their struggles and talk about how to maintain their culture among their children. Um, here are a couple quotes directly from the study. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge its importance again of children. This woman said, I can hear something, my son can be safe, but I am so sad that means he will never see Afghanistan as his home because it will always be my home. So this really like feeling like separated into two spaces. Um, I don't think I have the quote here, but one woman talked extensively about, she described it, she had this beautiful analogy of feeling like she was always gonna be cut in half. She was never gonna be whole again because half of her, her will always live in Afghanistan. She would never be whole again because she acknowledged that the possibility of going back to Afghanistan in her lifetime was not there. And that that would mean she would never feel like a whole person again. Um, this one in the middle is probably the most heartbreaking to me. Um, this woman said, I have brought my graduation gown with me here as into the United States so that one day I may finally graduate. Education is so important to me. I have to get out of school and flee just one day before my graduation. 
my dreams were shattered by the Taliban regime. So this woman talked about how she truly had graduation for a degree that she'd been working on for 10 years the next day and was forced to flee. And when she had one single bag of things to bring with her, one of the things she brought with her was her graduation gown, because that was such a dream of hers to make sure she graduated. And this loss of feeling and knowing that the women left in Afghanistan would never be able to do that because of the Taliban rule. I haven't, I haven't thought about this. As, as my dissertation, I haven't thought about these things in a long time. As Dustin said, you get so emotionally connected to it. I can like feel my voice shaking, because again, these women's experiences just really, um, really hit home. Um, so some of the lessons learned within my research, very similar to what Dustin and Michelle experienced as well. Such an importance of including women as your stakeholders and data collectors, even when barriers exist, even when it's really hard to do that, even when it takes the extra step, making sure women's voices are included. Reminding yourself that the community is the experts, even when sometimes they want to change your scales and they want to change the data you're collecting, they're the experts and they get to lead that. Um, questions that the community wanted to ask that I think us as researchers were kind of like, mm, I guess we'll put that in there. Those by far ended up being our best results and the most interesting things we found. Um, respecting your community partners and being really transparent. Um, we had we had bumps along the road similar to, to what Dustin described. And I think that a big mistake in our research was oftentimes focusing on these logistical battles on our own and not wanting to involve the community in those. We had specifically some issues with a lot of our, the Afghan community in Columbus was not really formalized. There wasn't a formal nonprofit organization which made paying them much more difficult than more traditional community-based research where you often pay through these nonprofit organizations. We were paying people directly and the university didn't like that. <laughs> and that created burdens for us. And we oftentimes weren't really transparent, not out of um, trying to hide things from community members, but trying to more of like, I don't wanna bother them with this. I'm gonna fix it on my own. And then that often left them confused and frustrated to be like, hey, you told me I was gonna get paid two weeks ago. I haven't, what's going on? And unfortunately it did burn a couple bridges because we didn't handle things well. Rightfully so, we weren't transparent and we lost those connections because those people were upset as they should have been. So a huge lesson learned of consistent transparency and treating them as an equal member of your research team. Admit when you mess up and something goes wrong because that is how research works and things go wrong. Um, and the importance of dissemination. I think in community-based research, this is, it's the last step, it's the final step, it's the hardest step. You've gotten the grant, you've gotten the IRB approved, you've collected all the data, you've analyzed all the data, you've gotten your fancy peer review publications, and then you're like, excellent, I'm done. You are not. The most important step is making sure you take the results of that research and you actually let the community know what happened. You go to the community with your findings and say, this is what we found, what are next steps? What do we wanna do with this? What's the best way to give you this data and this research such in a digestible, understandable way so that you can actually do something with it? You said you have these questions. We answered the questions, but that's not helpful if we don't tell you what answers we found. So again, most important part to me, and again, the hardest, sometimes the hardest step, because it's at the end, you're over it. You've looked at this data, for years at this point. You want to put it aside and you want to be done, you want to move on to the next thing, and you can't. You really have to take a step back and make sure you're disseminating that information back into the community. Yeah, and well, and I just yeah. put these last, you know, um, it's uh, only when genuine and reciprocal dialogue takes place between outsider and insider can we trust the outsider's account. And so that's again yeah. goes back to reinforcing what Jacqueline just said and just you know some examples of how to overcome some of these hurdles. Mm -hmm. The main one being establishing partnership, that word partnership. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and that's the last point of to me the point okay. of yeah. this research is using the privilege and the skills I have gained to have access to higher education, to get a PhD, to learn how to do research to uplift these voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not to center my voice, but to uplift the voices of the people who are in the research. Right. If I'm doing community-based work, every single publication I have always includes a quote from a participant. 
because it is their voices who should be central to the research and central to our findings.